Okay, good morning to you all joining us from all around the world. Uh, welcome to our first session of the Media and Communications webinar. Uh, this uh, webinar series is organized by the Journalists and Writers Foundation and Stony Brook University School of Communication and Journalism. It is my pleasure to moderate today's session. My name is Mehmet Kulic. I'm the president of the Journalists and Writers Foundation, which is an international civil society organization dedicated to the cultural, uh, to the cultural peace, human rights, and sustainable development. Last week, uh, we had our orientation session uh, and we provided some detailed information about the JWF and what we do as an NGO. We talked about the webinar series, speakers, topics, and our expectations from you. And also participants had a chance to introduce themselves. And also we had a guest speaker who talked about why press freedom matters. Uh, before we move into the session, I would like to share some of the house rules and the format of the sessions. So for each session, we have five minutes of introduction, 35 minutes of presentation by our guest speaker. Then we will have 20 minutes of Q&A session uh, for interaction, uh, interactive discussion. So we would like you to engage uh, during the session. However, we can write your questions on the chat room during the session. Uh, and we would like to hear your ideas, comments, and perspectives about the topic that you will be discussing today. And uh, we will call on your name to ask your question to our speaker uh, for you to, uh, to engage. And at the end of the session, we will provide you some information about the journalism project, uh, which is uh, writing a news article as a hands-on experience for you that will be published on our blog. And, uh, also, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, we uh, uploaded our JWF Academy, uh, which has reading resources and materials for you to read before coming to the webinar sessions. And uh, you know, Ezra, if you can share the link on the chat room, uh, it is jwfacademy.org. Uh, for this uh, week, our topic is economic freedom of media erosion of financial support for journalism. Uh, our guest speaker is going to talk about how the internet impacted the media sector and the journalism as a profession. How can we promote and protect press freedom and journalism profession? And uh, also how did the media, how did the digital transformation of industry affect journalism as well as uh, the way it is produced and consumed? Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Barbara Salvin from Stony Brook University School of Communication and Journalism. So we will share the, you know, the full bio uh, with the link, but just giving you a brief, inf brief uh, information about Professor Salvin. Uh, she teaches a variety of courses, including reporting and news writing at all levels, science journalism and the Journalism Without Walls program. As an academic, uh, her research interests include community journalism, women in journalism, and journalism education in the digital age. Uh, before she became an educator, Professor Salvin was a reporter for Newsday and New York Newsday, where she covered economic development. Professor Salvin is a member of a number of uh, organizations, such as investigative reporters and editors, journalism and women's symposium, National Numeracy Network, International Society of Weekly Newspapers Editors, and the Association for Education in Journalism and Mass Communications. Professor Salvum, uh, now the floor is yours. Thank you, Mehmed. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Hello, everyone. Um, it's nice to see students from all over the world here. I think this is such a wonderful program. This is my second year participating, and it's really an honor to be with all of you. Um, I know you have introduced yourself to each other last week, but um, perhaps you could just all put your introductions in the chat. We don't have a lot of time. So, um, and I, I do know some of you, who are my, some of my students here. It's nice to see you. Thank you for joining us. Um, so I'm just gonna jump right in. I'm gonna share my screen and we'll take it away. Those of you who are my students will be astonished to see that I have actually made a PowerPoint. Okay, here we go. Okay, here we are. One second. Okay. 
here we go. All right, this is today's workshop and let's get started. So um, you talked last week about the importance of a free press, how, how it holds the powerful to account, whether that power resides with the government, the military or business. Um, to be effective, a free press needs to be financially stable. And the in the past, before the internet uh, essentially took over communications, Newspapers were enormously profitable, um, but with the rise of the of the World Wide Web, that has changed, and the pandemic has further challenged the economic stability of journalism, of media globally. Uh, it's too soon to say what those changes will ultimately mean, but the warning signs are pretty clear that it's um, it's, it's an even more challenging time than it's ever been. That's not to say it's bleak, and we'll get to some good news before the end of this session. I promise. Okay, so um, the internet, just back up a second, sorry. Uh, the internet was created in part to help scientists share information. It was not designed for selling or profiting from information and that fundamental orientation has dramatically changed many industries that traded information for money in the past, including most, uh, most obviously the music business and the news business. Um, I'm gonna be talking primarily about newspapers in this program because they are historically the primary source for in-depth news in communities and have set the agenda for other forms of mass media. Uh, <clears throat> so newspapers, we think of them as, you know, something that you can hold in your hand, a piece of paper, but they're actually an industrial artifact, uh, processes that began in the 19th century, big machines, trucks, lots of space requirements, union contracts, high fixed costs that uh, kept newspapers at a financial disadvantage when smaller, more nimble, less expensive uh, online news organizations started springing up. Barriers to entry are very low. You can all start your own news organization today when you get off this call without the trucks and the real estate. Um, two main revenue streams for newspapers, advertising and circulation. Um, on the left of your screen, two types of advertisements, classified advertisements, you may have seen these in the movies. Uh, <clears throat> display advertising like the car and the fur coats here um, <clears throat> that were designed to attract consumer interest. For most of the 20th century, advertising provided about 80% of newspaper revenue and circulation, home delivery and newsstand sales provided about 20%. With the migration of advertising to the web, and particularly to search and social media, which we'll talk about, um, that balance has almost completely flipped to about 80% revenue from the audience, and most of that is subscription type revenue, not home delivery or newsstand sales. Newsstands sometimes don't even carry newspapers anymore in New York City, which always blows my mind when I see that, and advertising about 20%. Um, <clears throat> Now in the pre-internet era, you, the basic transaction was you bought your newspaper, you gave the newspaper company your, your circulation revenue. The newspaper was an intermediary between the public and the companies that wanted to sell goods and services. And those companies paid newspapers for advertising space. New readers consumed both news and advertising. Um, so bottom line today is that Although the revenue proportions have changed, the, the total revenue for newspapers is much, much, much lower than it was pre-internet. Um, <clears throat> so a quote that I like on this topic is that uh, from a, a writer named Christopher Wink, for more than 150 years, the two income stream double-sided marketplace model of advertising and subscriptions was so powerful and effective for so long that we forgot why would we would even want to have any other model at all. We essentially planted all our farms with a single crop and then watched a virus infect and destroy it. We had no resistance, no business model diversity. So once newspaper editors, um, but newspaper editors and publishers realized that the internet was actually a thing. They didn't think it was going to be a big challenge. After all, their product had outlasted many earlier challenges, movie newsreels, radio news, television news, because they had a secret weapon that none of these could provide. Classified advertising. Seems very dull and gray and boring, but provided about 40% of newspaper revenues 
pre-internet. Nothing could compete with that. You couldn't do classified ads on the radio or in a newsreel or even on television until Craigslist came along. That was the first big challenge. And of course, there have been many subsequent similar kinds of classified advertising services that are online. Newspapers were very late to this game and it got away from them. Um, once newspapers realized that the internet was not actually going away in the 90s, um, they began to panic and they started just giving up. We got to get on the web. They started pr producing what came to be known as shovelware, where they would just take shovel what was on their pages and put it on the web for free, even though it was so expensive to gather the news and, and, and write it and edit it. And it, this was in the days before there was even video on the web, but uh, it was extremely expensive to produce. And all of a sudden it was being given away for free. Um, in the meanwhile, consumers' habits had changed. They had less time for reading the newspaper in print or online, all these things that you see here, video games, YouTube, Reddit, so, social media, Netflix, smartphones, we all know how many challenges there are, how much competition there is for our attention. This has been referred to as the attention economy and newspapers had to compete a lot harder than they did before for consumers' attention. Um, an early product on the web were aggregators, news aggregators like you see here, um, you, you, Yahoo, Google, there were many others. And this is obviously kind of an old one, Death of Michael Jackson, that did happen quite a while ago. But this is an example of um, how aggregators would take just little snippets of news and put them all together in one place. So you could get a good sense of what had happened over the course of the day or on a particular story that you were interested in. You didn't have to pay anything. Again, it was costly to do the reporting that allowed newspapers and other news organizations to create the material that went into these snippets, but the platforms that were sharing these uh, received all the revenue from any advertising that appeared on these sites and didn't share it with the news companies. The result of all of this was that newspaper revenues tanked. Um, advertising revenue, as you can see here, fell off a cliff in the early 2000s. Meanwhile, Facebook and Google dominated the online advertising market um, to the point where, oh, excuse me one second, uh, first on, on computers and then on mobile, uh, and that does not seem to be coming back. Um, <clears throat> to the point where now ad revenue has the majority of it, the vast majority, more than half of all advertising revenue globally has gone to Facebook and Google. Um, in 2019, the Wall Street Journal reported that uh, Facebook and Google sucked up three quarters of the digital advertising revenue in local markets in the US. And now since the pandemic with everybody ordering things online and Amazon booming, Amazon has become a major um, player in the advertising field as well. And its revenue, including ad revenue has soared throughout the pandemic. One major challenge for newspapers, and some of this may come this as may a come. I'm sorry. Can you all hear me? Yeah, I think you're, you just had to echo off of someone's microphone for a little bit. That wasn't someone speaking. Okay, I'll continue. Uh, some of you may not even be aware of this, but when you um, click from search or click from social media to a, a news story, you are actually staying within the, the Google or Facebook world, you're not necessarily going to the news organization's page. Google introduced something called AMP, Accelerated Mobile Pages. They sold them the idea to, to news organizations because the formats would load faster, especially on, on mobile devices, perform better on search, um, but, and the same thing with Facebook's instant articles, um, to you know, because they would load faster, uh, it was hard for news organizations to say no to, um, to putting in the AMP software into their systems because if their pages loaded more slowly, that was a competitive disadvantage. The, but the real financial hit for news organizations with this AMP and Facebook Instant Articles was that the um, <clears throat> Facebook and Google kept control of the data the personal data, which is gold in our current environment. And 
not only that, but Facebook and Google kept the, the uh, bulk of whatever advertising revenue was generated through these systems. Um, <clears throat> not only that, but uh, a, uh, in 2020, a website called The Markup uh, reported that, did a, a study of 15,000 popular searches on Google and found that the AMP enabled results took up 13% of the results, the first results page. So Google favored its own uh, products above others, which is a, a theme for much of what Google does. Bottom line for all of this, the decline of local news, which is the heart, the, the, the blood, the, the, the necessary, um, basic building block of all news, local news, what's happening in communities, what affects people in their homes, in their towns, in their schools. Um, <clears throat> newspaper companies, uh, like many, co like most companies in a capitalist system, acquire debt to uh, buy other companies, to expand. And the newspaper companies, when the web revolution hit, had so much debt, their revenues dropped, they couldn't pay off the debt, leaving them vulnerable to acquisition by hedge funds and other sources of uh, private investment that were not particularly concerned about news as news or the public service value of news or the importance of the free press. They were interested in profit, um, cost cutting, uh, financial restructuring, restructuring, selling of real estate, bankruptcy. We'll talk about this more in a minute. Okay, so as revenue as revenues fell, ownership consolidated. This is these are this is U.S. information, but I think it's largely applicable across the um, at least in industrialized countries that had an active media sector, an active newspaper sector. Um, here again, circular circulation revenue and advertising revenue, circulation revenue climbing slowly, advertising revenue plummeting and the total being far below what it was before. Um, number of newspaper firms, as you can see here, just down, down, down. Uh, what is the problem with that? Why does it matter that there are fewer owners? Well, there are fewer viewpoints when there are fewer owners, fewer viewpoints expressed in the pages, in the editorial pages. Um, <clears throat> fewer, there's, there's more top-down centralization of news judgment um, <clears throat> and jobs declined because there was, again, more centralization of a lot of functions and just cuts, cuts, cuts. So this is before the pandemic, newspaper employment in the United States had fallen by nearly a quarter from 2008 to 2019. <clears throat> what happens when there is no local watchdog is not only is there less accountability journalism, less investigative journalism, less holding power to account, but a lot of other things that are, are not so obvious on the, a, a lot of other things that are not so obvious happen. Costs increase in municipalities when no one is questioning the spending in a public way. Taxes go up, the number of public employees goes up, fewer people are engaged in the electoral process either as candidates or voters, and the potential for increasing uh, partisan polarization, which have, we have seen in America and elsewhere, fewer resources for marginalized communities to address the problems in their communities. Uh, <clears throat> these results are from uh, studies by political scientists. So now let's take a closer look at the impact of consolidation. The idea of, the news at, of a news desert was um, first uh, brought into the public conversation by a professor and journalist at the University of North Carolina in the United States named Penny Abernathy. It's a brilliant concept and her group has produced this very important map looking at, uh, news, at counties in the United States that have one newspaper or no newspapers. So you can see that it is a, uh, a, a the spread of, of news deserts is, is increasing. This map doesn't show the increase, but this is continuing to happen as newspapers have been closing during the pandemic. Uh, <clears throat> you may live in a news desert. Um, and the problem with that is that no one is out there asking questions and, uh, and all those other ills that I showed you in the previous slide. So, Private equity. Private equity are um, private investment funds that uh, the goal of which is to pool capital and use it as collateral for loans to buy companies. The 
private equity fund then transfers whatever debt was used to acquire a company from the fund to the newly acquired company, which then has to make large debt payments, which weakens the company. At the same time, there is a strong emphasis on cutting costs. Um, <laughs> sometimes even things like news, newspaper pads and, and pens disappear from the newsroom, anything to cut costs. More important, perhaps, um, a lot of newsrooms in downtown areas that were prominent uh, citizens of a, of a business community, I'm thinking of the Chicago Tribune, the Daily News, um, the LA Times, for example, in, in the US, uh, the private equity owners sold the buildings and moved the newsrooms into smaller space away from the downtown center as a way to increase their profits. <clears throat> Today in the US, seven of the largest 25 newspaper owners are investment groups. Uh, there have been some proposals for government funding to buy out hedge funds to save local news, but that hasn't really gone anywhere yet. Alden Global Capital is sort of the uh, the most prominent villain in this in this saga in the U.S. Um, even its own employees uh, have have gone out in the streets to protest against the kind of ownership that Alden represents. Um, the union says that. Alden has cut about 71% of jobs in its newsroom. Alden has stakes in about 200 newspapers in the US. Uh, it's known for squeezing out cost savings and selling out real estate. Um, in fact, some reporters even publicly asked, pleaded for a private investors, local business people to take over some of these newspapers that Alden owns. That may be happening now, we don't have time to go into it today, but that's an interesting story and it's in its own. So the pandemic, um, what do we know so far? Well, as of last summer, these were just some of the news organizations in the US that had announced furloughs, cuts and closures. Um, so many famous illustrative names, new organizations and old, and there were many more. Um, more than 50 newsrooms had closed across America by last August, and that has continued to increase. And it's not just the US. Here's some data from the journalism crisis around the world. Um, let's see, I know we have people here from Europe, um, cutbacks in many, many countries. In India, cutbacks and closures. Latin America, several large publications permanently closed. In Africa, where the, the um, newspapers actually are in one of the strongest forms of media in many parts of Africa, um, there has been severe effects from the pandemic uh, and the loss of advertising. Now for the good news. It's not all bad. Startups are booming. Some of them will succeed. Some of them will grow. Newsletters are a new uh, and uh, not new, but an increasingly important way for journalists to communicate both individually and as organizations with subscribers to bring them in and increase subscription. Governments are beginning to act and we'll talk about that some more. Um, philanthropy is getting involved and journalists are still getting jobs, which I think is probably the biggest concern for some of you here. So the question is, Sorry, I skipped the slide. How can democratic societies preserve and protect journalism? Well, with Facebook and Google taking over so much advertising revenue and, and benefiting, profiting from the work of news organizations without really sharing those profits, the profits that news organizations help generate for them, whenever the heat gets a little high on Facebook and Google, <laughs> Whenever Facebook, whenever the heat gets a little bit high in governments, whether in, in Europe, Australia, the US, uh, where, where there have been some major efforts to try to rein in the platforms or uh, weaken their power in some way, Facebook and Google will throw some money at journalism. The, uh, you see here, the Google News Initiative. We're making a $300 million commitment to help local news. Wow, that's so generous of you, Google. In 2020, Google's global revenues were $182 billion. 
Facebook pledges $100 million to help journalists cover the pandemic in 2020, its revenues were $86 billion. <clears throat> so it's a little bit, and it's, it's not a bad thing, but it, it certainly does not uh, make up for, it, it does not really provide reparations for the damage that um, things like Google AMP and Facebook Instant Articles have wrought and the refusal to share the revenues generated by the news products. Now, the first country to take, well, to take perhaps the strongest stand yet is Australia, which um, has passed legislation requiring Facebook and Google to negotiate payments with news organizations that, um, whose products they use. This is still being worked out. Um, Facebook tried to have a news blackout in Australia where if people tried to share uh, content from Australian news organizations, they couldn't do it on Facebook. That lasted about a week. Um, negotiations on this situation are still ongoing. It hasn't fully taken effect, but countries all over the world are watching this experiment. The EU has been fighting the power of Facebook and Google and Amazon and Apple for a decade at least. Um, it's now been five years since the general data protection regulation, uh, which covers privacy primarily, uh, was passed in the EU. The EU has the EU's Comp Competition Commission is probing, as you see here, Google's ad business, Apple's app store and payment system, Facebook's marketplace and data, Amazon's control of seller data. And just this year in January, Google agreed to pay French publishers for news. So things are starting to change. The whole, uh, a recent survey on trust in um, different aspects of society in the US found that trust in tech companies had fallen dramatically over the last few years. Um, <clears throat> okay, so in the US, there are a number of bills before Congress. Um, in the Senate, the Journalism Competition and Preservation Act, which would uh, allow news organizations to come together and negotiate with the platforms to, um, to, to restructure the terms on which news companies content is distributed by the platforms. Um, right now, if newspapers and other news organizations tried to get together as a group to negotiate with the platforms, they would be in violation of antitrust laws. So this is trying to give them an opportunity for four years to negotiate new terms. In the House, the local Journalism and Sustainability Act is a series of tax credits aimed at sustaining uh, and providing a pathway to viability for the local journalism in the years to come. Um, a tax credit for subscribers to local newspapers, a uh, refundable credit for local newspapers to pay journalists, and even tax credits for advertisers to advertise with local newspapers, radios, and television stations. <clears throat> The U.S. has begun to take the platforms to court. Um, the antitrust laws were written in the ages of the robber barons, the railroad monopolies, and things like that. That doesn't, they don't really work, the, the U.S. antitrust laws for the way that platforms operate. But there are a number of lawsuits that have been filed in the last few months um, that challenge uh, Google and Facebook on my, on monopolistic practices and antitrust generally. Um, so still in the works, but uh, there's a clear trend here. Um, okay, uh, new approaches from uh, newsrooms, philanthropies and uh, other kinds of news organizations. Some of these are really exciting. Um, local digital websites. Uh, as I was saying earlier, Anybody can start a news organization right now. The entry, the cost of entry is very low. You need to get a server time, you need um, you know, a computer. Beyond that, you're pretty much set to go. Um, so from fall 2018 to 2020, um, more than 80 local digital news sites were started, which is pretty exciting. Well, at the same time, in the same period, about the same number closed. So what does that mean for the future? It means, well, it's always hard to start a small business. 
you're a local you're a local startup you have no legacy costs no printing press no trucks uh, no overhead but you also have no brand identity and you got to get your voice out there and compete in the attention economy so it's a challenging um, it's a challenging uh, effort but some of it will work um, I'm just going to go out of my presentation for a minute to take you to the Institute for Not Nonprofit News, which I think is really exciting. Um, this is the member directory of the Institute for Nonprofit News, which um, this is just the beginning of it. This is just the, just the A's. Uh, <clears throat> but these are all, again, various kinds of investigative journalism outfits, um, community journalism, local news. Uh, some of these are uh, particularly interested in a, uh, one area or another of, uh, you know, uh, like borderless is uh, uh, probably about immigration. Um, <clears throat> so what's cool about the Institute for Nonprofit News is that it provides, you know, if you're a small newsroom starting up with one or two people, you don't necessarily, and you're a journalist, you don't have the business expertise to, to run what is a business and has to make money. Even if, it, even if it's nonprofit, you still have to make money to support yourself. You have to pay salaries. You have to you know, maybe rent some office space. Um, so what the Institute does is provide the technological fundraising and business expertise uh, that mem members can use collectively. So I, I just think that's very exciting. Back to my slides. Um, uh, the Knight Foundation, the Knight family was a newspaper family. The Knight Company owned newspapers all across the country um, until they sold out uh, back in the around 2008, I believe. If they sold their their newspapers. Um, <clears throat> But they created a foundation which provides grants for all kinds of innovation in journalism. Um, it's been one of the major funders of experiments across the United States. Uh, a, a new grant making organization, the American Journalism Project, is uh, using an, a fairly new approach called venture philanthropy, which tries to give nonprofits. In, in the journalism space, the kind of capital support and partnership that um, venture capitalists can provide to for-profit businesses. At the same time, the AJP is trying to convince donors in, um, in communities that supporting local journalism is at least as important as supporting the local symphony orchestra or museums, and that donors should be giving money to uh, develop and support journalistic endeavors to provide the essential local news coverage that every community needs. Um, in 2019, the AJP raised $45 million and so far it's funded 11 local news out outlets across the country, across the US. Um, Newsmatch is another funding organization. So you can see that there is an increasing engagement with philanthropy to support journalism. The Lenfest Institute, which owns one of the major US newspapers, the Philadelphia Inquirer as a nonprofit, uh, also provides grants to support high impact journalism, new technology and innovation and diverse and growing audiences. A collaboration between newsrooms that's not something that happens centrally. It happens on a newsroom to newsroom basis. And it's a really exciting thing to watch too. Um, in the old days, newsrooms never shared resources. They didn't need to, they could fund everything themselves, but they have found that they can get a lot more bang for the buck, as we say here in the US, by sharing resources on certain types of stories. So you might see something like a newspaper and a radio station in the same market working on an investigative piece together. Now, investigative journalism is one of the areas that has really suffered with the migration, with the loss of revenue, because it's expensive. 
it's in some ways the uh, core of accountability journalism is investigations but they can take a long time. They don't not always fruitful. The reporters who are working on investigations are not available to provide uh, daily journalism. So the kind of collaboration among different newsrooms in a community allows for investigations that newsrooms might not be able to do on their own. And there are also collaborations with, between national organizations and local organizations, which we'll talk about here. So for example, Report for America is a, um, a foundation that uh, that provides local newsrooms with young reporters for a year or two. The newsroom pays half the salary. Report for America pays the other half. Uh, it news organizations have to compete to um, make the case for why they need this kind of help from Report for America. And then there's a competition among young journalists to get a spot as a Report for America fellow for a year or two. Um, it's pretty exciting. They're doing some incredible work. Uh, ProPublica Local Reporting Network. ProPublica is one of the early and most successful uh, investigative reporting outfits on a national scale. It's where a lot of investigative reporters went from newspapers when newspapers closed or cut back on their own investigative units. Um, <clears throat> so ProPublica does some incredible work and it has found a way to um, work with local newspapers to local newsrooms to uh, do accountability journalism, providing them the kind of uh, data support that they might need from their own databases, providing them with help in understanding how to do this kind of work, providing them with reporting help. So that's exciting. So the Solutions Journalism Network, my students know that I'm a big fan of this approach. Solutions Journalism is a, it, it's, it's not a new kind of journalism, but it's a, a shift in emphasis that I think is a really interesting development. Uh, solutions journalism describes itself as rigorous reporting on responses to social issues. In other words, instead of doing yet another story about a problem, let's say hunger um, in a community, which it, in rich countries and poor countries alike, there, there is hunger. Uh, and it's, 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 it's really can be enormously upsetting to read about some of these problems and people get burnt out on reading about all the problems in our society. So what solutions journalism does is look at how people are responding, whether their response is effective. If it's not effective, why not? Can this response be tried somewhere else? It's a more optimistic approach to look at what people are doing that might be working to solve some problems. And it tends to bring in subscribers, it increases engagement, and it's, it uh, helps with news burnout. So I'm a big fan of it, as you can tell. The Journalism Crisis Project is a uh, Columbia University effort. It's um, a research and databases on local journalism to know really what's happening out in local newsrooms. Um, so that's an interesting development. Substack, some of you may have heard of. Uh, Substack is one of a number of uh, Substack is one of a number of uh, platforms that allow journalists to send out their own newsletters and keep most uh, of the if they charge a membership fee for subscribers, they get to keep most of the revenue. So a number of big name journalists have moved to Substack. Um, away from outside of news organizations are just doing doing their own work on their own. A little dubious about that personally, because I think everybody needs an editor and you don't necessarily have that at Substack, but it's an interesting idea in that it can um, provide another revenue source for journalists. Uh, news Start is a program at, the, at West Virginia University that is training the next generation of weekly newspaper editors um, in how to run their businesses. So uh, that's a, another promising development. Now, all these things are gonna be part of the answer. There's no one silver bullet to the problems of local news. Um, it's going to require all kinds of investment, all kinds of approaches, all of the above approaches needed. But I think that there is a, uh, a real potential for local journalism to come back strong and to continue doing the important work, the essential work that it does in democratic societies. Thank you. So your questions. Um, well, Professor Selwyn, thank you so much for this amazing uh, presentation. And uh, I mean, 
uh, some of the statistics that you shared were mind blowing and how mm -hmm. the media has shifted uh, with the transformation of digital media and how the industry is impacting journalism. So, I mean, I have questions, but of course I would like to give the floor to our uh, you know, uh, participants. Uh, so if you would like, if you have a question, uh, we can get the questions first, then later on, if you have a comment, uh, uh, you can join us. So, I mean, uh, if anybody has a question, uh, please just unmute yourself and then uh, you can ask your question. Um, so like regarding these news deserts, what, what do you think is like the biggest um, risk or like the biggest scare that you have in terms of like just places having no local newspapers? Because for example, um, last year, the Tampa Bay Times, I, I'm, Tampa's not a news desert, but um, they recently found out that like an entire downtown area of the city was being purchased by Scientologists and stuff like that. Like it's kind of scary to think like a, some, a group that powerful could just buy a rural town with no newspapers and just like no one would know about it, stuff like that. Yeah, the, the potential for abuse, financial abuse, corruption, um, it, it's just mind blowing to think that nobody's out there watching. Um, so yeah, I think news deserts are a real challenge. Um, I think there's also, for example, a role that universities can play in supplying news uh, in news deserts. Um, and I think that that's something that is starting to happen. I didn't mention that in my slides, but there are a number, there's a really interesting thing going on in Kansas, which is a largely rural state where uh, University of Kansas journalism students are providing news resources in news deserts. And there's also another interesting thing that's happening where um, there's a lot of, uh, and I think the American Journalism Project, which I mentioned is some of its projects are using this approach where they're teaching regular people who are not trained journalists how to collect information, how say to cover a municipal meeting um, and not write a story about it, but just provide the information on what happened at the meeting. It gets put into a database that then journalists can mine. Um, going to meetings is a very labor intensive and time consuming and often quite boring thing to do, but uh, it is essential work in covering government. You have to be there to see what's going on. So this is, a, I think, a, a really interesting approach that can um, do something to ameliorate the problems of news deserts. On the Thank subject you. of those citizen journalists, if I like the idea of bringing the community in on just utilizing the resources at hand, whatever they are, but I guess I just wonder sometimes what is the role of a full-time journalist then when you're when you have major citizen journalism enterprises or even editors at say a reader worker co-op, which are discussed in the readings where they readers have a say in what is published or investigated? Well, I think producing uh, news in a consumable form is something that a trained journalist uh, in the that's gathered by these citizen journalists. Um, not everybody can write. I think you probably all know that. Most of you are probably writers of one sort or another and um, it's not an easy thing to do to tell a story in writing or in in any other uh, platform, whether it's photography or, or um, you know, visual journalism, audio journalism. Those are skills that take years to hone, and that's the role of the journalist is to tell the story. So that that doesn't change. You know, I don't think that news consumers are going to go to a database and you know, plow through it to try to find out what happened at the town board meeting or the city council meeting. You, you need that in a story form and you need the context that a journalist can provide. What happened before, not just at this meeting, but what is it building on? What is the problem? What is, it, what is the council trying to address? What has been tried and failed before? So all of that is the work of the journalists and that doesn't change. Thank you, Professor Selvin, yeah. for a wonderful presentation. I have a question about um, the ads and, and revenue surrounding that. So how do we as journalists um, stay neutral and unbiased in our, I, I always ask this um, because it's such a, it's such a difficult um, question for me at least, how do we stay neutral and biased and unbiased if ads um, are 
are you know supporting us financially or um, if we're working for a newspaper or a magazine that has an affiliation with some sort of corporation you know how do we just stay doing our job rather than succumbing to um, the people who are are giving us money right so in other words if you if there's a major polluter say that uh, is a, a, a source of advertising revenue for your news organization how do you that the you know environment exactly. that yeah. that is done well it's a challenge it's there you know uh traditionally there has been a wall between the editorial side of newsrooms and the publishing side which deals with the money um that wall has been penetrated in new ways in the given the financial realities of the digital age but Here's something for another way to think about the problem. No matter where the money comes from, you need to think about the challenges that uh, the interests of the sources of that money have, whether it's a business, as in your situation, whether it's readers. Yes, you know, in an ideal world, the, the interests of the readers are all wonderful things that we should respond to, but think about people you know people can have interests that are not conducive to the civility people can have in discriminating in in um they can be greedy so even responding to the needs of the audience can be can you hear me i just gotta you can still hear me okay um responding to the needs of an audience can be challenging and if you're getting money from a foundation from a donor that donor may have particular interests in one thing or another. So there are always pressures, financial pressures, and it's the job of the journalist and the newsroom to understand what those pressures are and to resist them. Not easy, but it's part of the job. Through the chair, Professor Barbara, thank you very much. You have given a wonderful presentation. Uh, my question is, uh, what are the new approaches for journalism in Africa? Because I realize what you have said is exactly the problems we have in Africa. Um, some of the newspapers have closed down, people have lost their jobs, and uh, but the new normal, what can we say? What, which, which way to have a new approach, more particularly in Kenya? You did mention something about local digital website. How will it work? Well, you know, um, I'm going to direct you to the the learning resources that. Uh, let's see. Um, I had that academy site open, but um, one of the articles that I posted with the learning resources. Um, had to do with finding new business models in Africa. Um, uh, thank you very much, Sam. Um, okay, I'm just gonna click on that, that link. Um, so if you wanna just look at that page, the article uh, on why economic questions are key to Africa's media freedom, um, I think that was the article that talked about the importance of moving moving to digital, uh, some government support. Um, and this, yeah. Uh, no, that's not the one that I was looking at. Um, hold on a second, folks. Um, uh, I'm going to put a different link into the chat. This was an article that I thought that I've seen cited in, in a number of places. Um, hold on, back to the screen. Um, mitigating the impact of COVID-19 on newspapers in Africa. So this writer, um, who I believe is, I'm not sure exactly what country he, he's from, but um, he, he calls for um, government relief in the short term. He, basically the proposals in this article uh, talk about short term over the next few years, ways to support journalism in Africa while news organizations regroup and move online. Um, 
Now, of course, that's not a perfect solution either because uh, broadband penetration in Africa and the costs of, of data in Africa, the one is low, the other is high. The cost of data is much higher in Africa than it is in, um, in, in, in more industrialized countries. So um, I don't know that these are a perfect solution, but it's a good place to start a discussion. Um, Thank I'm, you. Um, I was wondering if uh, you do, do you know how aware people are of the crisis in local journalism outside of the journalism field? And I'm not sure that's a conversation that journalists should be making more of an effort to have with a general audience. That's an excellent question, Brianne. And in fact, I meant to say something about it and skipped over it in my slides. People aren't aware. People think that their local news organizations are doing great, but they, they really are not aware of the challenges. Uh, as individuals, that's something that we can all do is subscribe to a local journalism, a local newsroom, uh, rather than trying to get around paywalls and things like that, as we all are often tempted to do, but really support them. You know, you want them to be there. Um, really aware of journalists don't like to make themselves the story. So they haven't necessarily done a good job of telling that story to their audiences. One organization that is doing a good job of that is The Guardian, the um, UK, the British based news organization. If you go on any Guardian story, whether you're looking at it on your phone or your computer at the end, there's a little pop-up that says, well, you're here, <clears throat> we need some money. Um, to continue providing the kind of information that you are relying on. So I think, I think more news organizations should be doing that kind of thing. Another question? Um, you mentioned the Guardian and when I'm always, when I'm like looking through their articles, I always see that they're free and they still don't have like a subscription thing that's up, but they keep going. I think that's due to the fact that they're very like open um, by telling people that they are actually struggling and a lot of people do donate. So I like that. My question was unrelated to this. So um, the dominance of Facebook and Google and like digital advertising, it poses a particular challenge for local newspapers. How do you think local newspapers can make a comeback from this? Like maybe big organizations will be able to fight for some of their rights, but local newspapers, they're being attacked from multiple sides. How do you think they can, you know, sort of get on this Facebook and Google ad thing? You know, there was an interesting uh, sort of experiment that happened last week. I'm going to say it was in Kansas City in the US where there, there's a, a newspaper that covers, and I know it's called the Northeasterner and it's in the Northeast corner of Kansas City. And one day last week, its front page was blank. And people, over subscribers were calling saying, what happened? My, my newspaper came, the front page is blank. Well, this is what will happen if we go under. You're not gonna have local news. And there was a, hu a huge outpouring of support from the community like, whoa, we better do something. So I think there are ways for news organizations to communicate their needs to their readers, to their viewers, to their listeners. Um, as, so that's kind of on the, you know, the demand side, getting people to show that they really need and want these things and have to have to pay for it if they value it. Um, and then there were all those other ways that uh, news organizations can reduce their costs by collaborating, by working with um, programs that help them uh, su supply reporters, by getting grants and becoming nonprofits. That's actually a big trend is for-profit news organizations becoming nonprofits, which gives them favorable tax treatment. Um, and so th those, there, there are just a lot of different tools that are gonna to have to come into play. And over the last 15 years, more and more approaches have been tried, have, have shown some success. So it's just a lot of little things that I think are gonna provide the long-term health and support. Another question? Uh, 
uh, now, I mean, uh, we're coming to the end of the session. Uh, uh, at this time, I would like to welcome you all uh, to share any comments uh, or any perspectives uh, about the uh, session. And uh, so we would like to hear your, uh, your feedback, opinion, and sometimes you're coming from different parts of the world. Uh, so, you, you know, there might be some other challenges out there. So feel free to, you know, you know uh, give your comments or your feedback. I'm just going to, I had a list of questions that I had prepared, sort of thought questions that I, I'm just going to put them in the chat. Um, some th other things for you to think about that we didn't really talk about. I think, one of the, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I, yeah, one of the things that I would like to share actually was uh, who's making the headlines. Uh, I think it was in 2018. So I was invited for an interview uh, from a uh, news agency from India. And then it was during the UNGA conference and the UNGA uh, General Assembly meetings in New York. So one of the questions was uh, who's making the headlines and who's making the news. And uh, so, so I think that's, that's one of the challenges uh, between uh, you know, global and local. So we really would like to go from local to global, think about what's happening in the world. But on the other hand, uh, many of the local events or local news are not getting the headlines. So, uh, I mean, you've, give, you've given some ideas that, you know, governments and we should support local journalism or local media uh, so that, you know, people, they hear about what's happening in their local community. But uh, as, uh, you know, as citizens or, you know, if, uh, students or uh, people who are young professionals in journalism. Uh, what are some of the things, you know, Dr. Uh, uh, Professor Salvin that we can do to promote uh, local journalism so it doesn't phase away? As individuals, are you saying? Yeah, as individuals, yes. Well, subscribing for one thing, um, sharing. In, in an age of social media, sharing the work that you respect is, you know, an important way to bring people into you know, local news to uh, just so that they others can see the value of it. Um, talking about it, um, writing about it. I think that there, as you know, as as news consumers and as emerging journalists, there are many things that uh, participants in the seminar can do to um, increase the the chances of success for local news organizations. Uh, from your own experience, like, would you recommend our participants to uh, start their career as a journalist from local newspapers? Absolutely. It's an extremely gratifying career. Uh, people need you and uh, rely on you. And you're, as in all kinds of journalism, you're always learning something new and you're always working to become a better storyteller. I think it's just an enormously satisfying uh, profession to pursue. Um, and I think the jobs are for people who are, who are skilled, who are talented, who have the drive and the passion, the jobs will be there. Um, and there are alternatives now, like if you have a pa passion for a particular niche in journalism, something that you specifically want to cover, uh, whether it's environmental journalism or something else, and you're finding things that aren't being published somewhere, and you don't have a place where you can sell them yourself, you can start your own newsletter and build your own following through social media. And, and that's a remarkable thing. So I, I think that there are, there are ways to survive as an individual journalist um, and to do the kind of work that you want to do. Well, thank you, Professor Selvin. Uh, I think we have come to the end of our session. I have two announcements uh, before we end uh, today's session. Uh, number one, uh, for those who did not participate in the orientation session, uh, we have uh, a, a journalism project uh, for you to have an uh, um, hands-on experience, uh, so which is uh, writing a, a news article, uh, or it could be a story. Uh, so we would like uh, you to select a topic of interest on press freedom, freedom of speech or expression, uh, and it could be related to, it could be economic, social, or environmental. Uh, from, from those approaches. Uh, so 
uh, we would like you to research on the topic and then um, you know gather fact-based uh, you know data uh, based on open resources, interviews, or other available sources. And uh, so we would like you to write a news article or a news story that will be published on our blog and our website for visibility. And uh, again, so this is not a mandatory, but we definitely encourage you to, to do so. Uh, and uh, if you go to our website, jwfacademy.org, you can see some of the articles written by uh, the participants uh, last year uh, over there. So this is a good practice. And, uh, and also we will have uh, our uh, guest speakers uh, to, to review them and provide some feedback uh, for you. So this is number one. Number two, uh, uh, May 3rd, as you know, is the International Press Freedom Day and it is celebrated and commemorated uh, throughout the world. So we are planning a panel discussion uh, on this day and we are planning to have uh, maybe a, a couple of our speakers, uh, guest speakers, but at the same time, we would like to invite uh, some of you as the participants to join this uh, uh, discussion as a speaker or, or as, a, as a moderator. So just keep this in mind. Uh, so we are planning this for May 3rd, uh, 2021, and we will provide you all the details, uh, hopefully in, the, in upcoming days. So without further ado, I thank you so much, uh, Professor Selvin, for your amazing presentation. And thank you so much for joining us uh, with your questions and feedback. And we hope to see you next Saturday. Until then, please uh, you know, visit our website, again, jwfacademy.org for the learning resources for week two. Thank you Thanks and have an Thank you.